I'm very pleased today to be able to have a conversation with Sahawat Davis, um, famous for being the founder of the Financial Services Authority in the UK. You've seen the role of regulation evolve over a period of time. So, Howard, maybe the first thing we probably need to do is to, to clarify how is that distinguished from the models that today exist in Canada or Australia. Mm. If you look at the world's regulatory systems uh, in different countries, I think you can primarily identify three, three models. One is the traditional three-pillar model, whereby the central bank regulates banks there's a securities commission, an SEC, that regulates securities markets, and then usually some other body that regulates insurance, uh, sometimes as a government ministry or sometimes an insurance commission. That was the sort of standard model, if you like. And then some countries have moved in one of two directions. One which is called Twin Peaks, which was actually a paper written by somebody from the LSE and somebody from the IMF about 15 years ago, which said, that you should distinguish between prudential regulation, i.e. capital safety and soundness regulation, and conduct of business regulation. In other words, transparency, disclosure, insider dealing, all that stuff. Uh, and proposed that those were two different uh, subjects, if you like. And the Australians moved to institute something called Twin Peaks with the, uh, a prudential regulator outside the central bank, actually, uh, and a conduct of business regulator separately. Now, actually, very few other countries have followed that. The Canadian model is a bit different because there is one prudential regulator, but there isn't a national securities regulator because it's all done on a provincial basis. Uh, but the Netherlands have moved in that direction, and there are one or two other countries thinking about it. Then the third model is the integrated, integrated regulator yeah. model, whereby you have a single entity that does all aspects of regulation. And at the last count, there were about 50 countries who had that model. And indeed, that's been the one that's been growing most rapidly. In some cases, that's done actually inside the central bank. Mm. In a case like Singapore, it's the Monetary Authority of Singapore does monetary authority and regulation at the same time. But in the big countries who have done it, they've typically set it up outside the central bank. So that's true in, in Sweden, it's true in Germany, it's true in the UK. Uh, and those countries have, have typically set up one institution and have s concluded that having that mixed up with monetary policy is probably not a good idea. And having said that, it's exactly there that it probably went wrong in the UK. Would you, would what you went agree? wrong exactly? Well, if you look at um, Northern Rock, the kind of supervision that the FSA had a mandate on and um, the information that was transmitted back to the Bank of England in terms of the systemic risk that it represents. Yes, well, I'm, not a, I'm not persuaded. I mean, the FSA has produced its own report on the supervision of Northern Rock, which is very self-critical and which identifies mistakes that were made in the supervision of Northern Rock and its rapid growth, uh, too rapid growth in retrospect, and its excessive reliance on securitization, etc. And I think that's where, to me, the big problems lie, and the FSA has said so. This issue about the relationship with the Bank of England, I'm not convinced. Um, I think the Bank of England knew perfectly well what was going on in the securities markets. They had a big financial stability area. They could know that. And, and nobody's convinced me that it was just a question of not uh, an information flowing backwards and forwards. Uh, I think the Bank of England knew what was going on. But when it came to it, the Bank of England did not think it was right to intervene to rescue Northern Rock um, because they didn't think that the entity were, could survive and so they didn't want to provide large amounts of liquidity to it and eventually of course it had to be taken over by the government and had to be nationalized right um, and that process took some time because the government was not prepared to accept that it needed to be nationalized so it was undoubtedly a messy process um, and I think it did demonstrate uh, a lack of leadership by the government because it was quite clear that ultimately in a bank failure, the government has to underwrite it, and we've seen that all over the world. The governments, if it's a question of solvency support, capital support for an institution, that has to be the government. In the US, it's the US Treasury. It's you know, not the Federal Reserve that provides right. new capital. Right. So that was, the, that was the problem, I think. But then 
As a result of Northern Rock, there, there seemed to be a call for the FSC to be imbibed back into the... Yeah, I think that's quite wrong, in my view. Uh, I don't see any need for that at all. And indeed, I think, nor does the Bank of England. Right. The Bank of, now, what needs to happen, I think, is that, and which is happening, is the Bank of England has been given a new formal statutory duty for financial stability right. and is undoubtedly strengthening that area and it may well be that the in, bank had uh, uh, ratcheted back its work on financial right. stability. In the time that the FSC was set up and, and, and grew its mandate and, and, and all of the intricacies of its work, what kind of internal capabilities did it create as a result of you know operating independently? Well the first thing important to note is that the FSA took 450 people from the Bank of England and therefore all the Bank of England's abilities on prudential supervision and market oversight etc were moved to the FSA so there was no change I was at the Bank of England That's right. one day and then I was at the FSA the next day so the argument that somehow it lost expertise is just frankly absurd because it actually took all of the expertise from the Bank having of England said to do that, that. Um, it erred on the side of the customer in, in no I think it's just not true these arguments are made by people who have no understanding of what the regulator actually does I simply can't see any proof that the FSA biased itself in favor of consumer in fact we were often told that we didn't do enough I mean the consumer protection people were always and uh, arguing the FSA was not sufficiently pro-consumer and the FSA is one of the very few regulators in the world the first regulator in the world to produce its own financial stability report because the FSA took its financial stability responsibilities quite seriously if you compare the FSA to say APRA or the OSFI in, in Canada their mandates are much more narrowly defined were you taking on too much? I don't think so. I, didn't, uh, I never felt it when we were. And indeed there's an important need for uh, communication between the conduct of business and the financial stability regulators uh, in a number of areas. I mean especially in the insurance area and in Australia of course the failure of HIH. There was then a Royal Commission looking into that which argued that there needed to be much closer communication between the financial stability and the conduct of business regulators uh, so uh, but I just don't uh, I, I don't understand where the argument that the FSA was only a consumer protection regulator comes from it certainly does not bear any resemblance to what I job I did during the six years I was there